Good morning, friends. How you guys doing? You well? I was harassing John David like a pair of twos, seriously, <laughs> which implies the whole we endorse gambling here at Austin Christian Fellowship, which we don't. So um, it's so good to see you guys. Welcome. If I don't know you, my name is Will Davis Jr., and it is great to have you here. I want to greet all of you guys online as well and say thanks for joining us. Um, it's a beautiful day in Austin, Texas, and from wherever around the globe you may be joining us, we're glad you're here. For you guys in the house, for you guys online, if at any point during the week even, um, you want to know more about Austin Christian Fellowship, do you hear, okay, you guys online can't hear it. Do you hear the vibration coming through the wall? That's, that's, AC, that's Austin's Camp Fund, ACF Children's Ministry, taking the hill up there. Isn't that wonderful? We encourage that kind of behavior. Um, they're so good. Anyway, if you want to know more about our church, 512-866-9908. If you'll text uh, the phrase ACF Connect, one phrase to 512-866-9908. We'd love to have a conversation with you. You'll get a link back. It can tell you about prayer. It can tell you about... Um, Serving opportunities, giving opportunities, children and student ministries, which we do exceptionally well here. Got to shout out a row of good-looking kids right here. Got a bunch of kids down here. We got, we're baptizing in a minute. You guys rock. Sick them, bears. Go, bears. Yes, yeah, sick them. Anyway, there's other shirts, but I'm not going to call them out. So, um, anyway, if you want to know more about our church, this is a great church. I can say it because I'm, the part that's great, I'm not involved in, and so I can brag on it. And um, we love to be your home. Everybody needs a church. Even atheists need a church, because at some point they're going to need a pastor. And we'd love to have you be part of ours. Uh, no questions asked. We'd love to have you be part of it. So feel free. So Christmas Eve is approaching. Next Sunday is the last Sunday we're having church in 2021. We don't ever have church. I shouldn't say we don't ever. We don't typically have church the week after Christmas Eve. So our last, our last services are Christmas Eve. They're coming up. Um, the plan is... Outside, um, we'll be fondly around here called the Grassy Knoll at Austin Christian Fellowship. Um, one service, four o'clock. If we're watching the weather, if it gets like it's going to be dicey, if it's cold, we're going outside. If it's rainy or sleety or otherwise, we'll come back in and do multiple services. Stay tuned that week. But we think looking at the weather, we're going to be great to have an outside. Uh, we got to really irritate our neighbors at least twice a year. And we try to do that around holidays, which is great. Thanksgiving, no, Easter and Christmas. So, um, it's, it'll be a blast. We did it last year, and we'd love to have you guys bring your lawn chairs. It's bring your own everything. So lawn chairs, pets. I got in trouble last year for saying fire pits, so I can't say fire pits anymore. But come on. It'll be a blast, and we'll keep you up to date on information. All right, let me, um, let me pray. Lord, thank you for the time. Thank you for the wall vibrating. No telling what they're doing up there, Lord, but it's so good. Kids love coming to church here. And I thank you for that. I thank you for the students here on the front row ready to support their friend getting baptized in a minute. Uh, thank you for the men and women in the room. And today, Lord, I'm, as I talk about Joseph, I'm particularly thankful for godly men in my life. Rock star men who pointed me to you and spoke you to me. And um, I pray for those men today. I pray there'll be more of us in the room and more of us in the city. Lord God, thank you for grace and mercy. Thank you. For, Lord, I pray for people in Kentucky um, who are just devastated today and hurting because of tornadoes that are just vicious and ruthless and so much loss of life around Christmas. It seems like every year around this time, Lord, something happens that just breaks people's heart. And we trust you. We look to you. But Lord, we pray for an outpouring of relief, physical, emotional, spiritual, from churches in that area and from the country to that area, Lord. And there's a lot of hurt from a lot of things going on, not just there. And this is the time, Lord, your angels said, peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Lord, make it so. Make it so. Please humble and uh, anoint me right now as I teach. We love you and pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, going to be in Matthew chapter 1. If you've got a Bible and want to turn there, we're in week chapter 2 of a series called Jesus Brought to You By. And my daughter Emily, Emily Boone, uh, taught last week on Ruth and introduced us. What we're doing is we're looking at the, the part of the Bible we all love to skip, which is the genealogy. And it's like, okay, I don't know why all these names are here, but I can't pronounce half of them, don't know if the rest of them are, so we're moving on. 
But to the audience that the two gospel writers who give us genealogies, Matthew and Luke, to their audiences, it was a really big deal, especially the Jewish uh, audience, to be able to trace um, Jesus' lineage as the promised Messiah all the way back to the father of the Jewish country, Jewish uh, nationality, Abraham. Luke takes it back to Adam. But, but Matthew, who was writing to Jews, takes it back to the father of the Jewish culture, called out by God to start a new nation, Abraham. And it was promised that the Messiah would come from the, the, the seed of David, which came from Abraham, the king, kingdom of David. And so if you read that list, there's some pretty noble and not so noble characters in it. And next week, I'm going to talk about kind of the color um, in, the, in this genealogy. It's like if that whole bunch got together around Thanksgiving table, it'd be interesting. Because one or two of the worst kings in Israel's history are on that list. Like brutal, ruthless kings. They're in the lineage of Jesus. Um, more than one woman of the night is in that list. So it's like, this is, wow, if that bunch is having dinner together, it's going to be something. And next week, I'll talk about some of the color and, and variation of, of good and bad, how God used this family line to give us the Messiah. And he can do it through yours as a point. Okay, don't give up on your family. That's the point. Talk about that next week. Today, I'm talking to you about Joseph. Been so excited about this message all week and been praying a lot about it because I'm a guy. And this is a message about a guy, a man. Last week, Emily gave us a great look at a godly woman who was a, not even a Jew. She was a Moabite. And um, we weren't even, Jews weren't even supposed to marry Moabites, and they did. So she came into the Jewish line completely backwards, and she, God used, up, used her to help give us King David, who gave us the Psalms, the guy who killed Goliath. Great story. So where Emily last week talked about a woman in this line of Jesus, today I want to talk about a man. And he's, talk about a hard assignment. This is a guy given the responsibility of being Jesus' earthly father. Uh, he's a descendant of David, which kept the promised line. So was Mary. They were both descendants of David. Uh, but he had, he had the assignment of, being, of raising a child he didn't father. Any men relate to that? But no one else fathered either. He had this really unique assignment of, of having to deal with the miraculous nature of his son's birth that no one believed. They dealt with the rumors and criticism and jokes long after, even in Jesus' adulthood, he was accused of being an illegitimate child because of the miraculous nature of his birth or the earthly fatherless nature of his birth. How would you like to be the guy that gets the job to raise the son of God? How would you like to be the guy who lost the son of God at age 12? Remember the whole scene in the temple? How's that on your resume? We lost, how, hey, we lost the son of God. That's going to look good. What a job. But there's so much in Joseph. So I'm really, we'll all learn from this, but I'm so, I was looking around the room during worship. Is there some young men and some more seasoned men like me in the room? And I'm so glad you're all here because we get, and I'm so glad you guys are watching online. And if you don't, if you know a guy who's going to miss the service, send this message to him. Because Joseph, he's called St. Joseph in the Catholic Church. He's just a guy. Mary's just a girl. She was a young one. He's just a guy that, that's trying to get it right. He's not perfect. And he's the guy God taps. I want you to raise my son. Okay. Think about that. So just the record, Matthew 1, 16, Jacob, not the Jacob of the patriarchs, the Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. This is um, centuries later. Jacob fathered Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. Notice that the writer here, Matthew, does not give credit to Joseph for being the, the progenitor of Jesus because he wasn't. There was no physical relationship. And so he, Matthew and Luke both assert the really unique nature of Jesus' birth. I'll talk in a moment about why it was important. I'm not going to go into much detail on it, but the virgin birth is part of what we believe in Christianity, something 
Nothing's impossible to God, and it's something that makes a lot of sense when you understand theology, and specifically sin. But Joseph is listed as the man married to Mary who raised Jesus, his earthly father. He was a descendant of King David, which legally makes Jesus a descendant of David, but so was Mary, so it's covered in both sides. I want to go to Matthew 1, verse 18, which is a Christmas text. I want to walk through just a minute this, <laughs> um, this birth of Jesus from Joseph's side. So G Luke tells us Mary's side of the story and how she has an appearance of an angel and says, you're going to have a baby and you're not going to be with a man. Okay. And then Ma Matthew tells us the Joseph side of the story because it kind of looks like they didn't talk about it, which I think is hilarious. How do you not talk about that? Oh, by the way. So here's, here's the story. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, Messiah is the same word as Christ, the promised one, the anointed one, the one prophesied for centuries, the one that the Israelites were expecting to come, the anointed or promised one. Now, this is the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, as follows. When his mother Mary, she was probably 15 or 16, really young, when she had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, which is reference to sexual union, before they came together, she was found, I love this, she was found to be, with, to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Oh, she's pregnant. Well, no one on the planet thinks it's the Holy Spirit, right? Because it happened all the time. And the law gave specific instructions on how to deal with somebody. So betrothal was a big deal. It was more than engagement. It was basically marriage without the privileges. Today we do the privileges without marriage. Sorry, that was snarky, but I had to say it. Uh, today we do the privileges of marriage. We don't get married. This was marriage without privileges. This was a, a you're my wife, but we're going to linger a minute and just, just we're not going to live together, but we're, you're legally, we're legally each other's now. And at some point in the future, we'll have a big party and consummate the marriage, but we're going to just go ahead and live through this more than engaged but not acting married period to settle things legally before we go the rest of the way. So it was a very serious thing. And so to, for one of them to be parenting a child, fathering or mothering a child during that time, be, be pregnant or cause someone else to be pregnant is adultery. And it was, it was a breaking of marriage vows. It was a big, big deal. And the law addressed it. The law of Moses addressed it. Well, uh-oh, I mean, this is serious stuff, and it's a deal breaker. It's a deal breaker. If, if you're a righteous man or a righteous woman, and this thing pops up, then all bets are off. Now, I want you to think about Luke chapter 1 and go read it sometime. You've read it before. It's a Christmas story in Luke chapter 2, but Christmas 1 is when Mary gets visited by the angel, same angel that comes here and explains to her how this happens. It's the mystery of the Holy Spirit is able to cause conception in Mary's body without a physical act of sexual union. And that's what happens because the sin nature passes, Psalm 51 teaches us, through the Father. Romans teaches us too. So Jesus, in order to be a perfect sacrifice, he had the temptation to sin, but he wasn't born guilty with his sin nature, a broken nature like we are. He couldn't be guilty of anything, including a broken nature. He had the chance to sin, but didn't. But because he wasn't fathered by an earthly father, that sin nature wasn't in him that we have. He wasn't born guilty. And that's why he couldn't have an earthly father, or he wouldn't have been a qualified sacrifice. God, see, God thought about all this stuff. So you need a virgin birth. Okay, let's make that happen. <laughs> Crazy. So they were betrothed. They had not been together, Mary's pregnant. Plot thickens. Now, put yourself in these humans' place. I mean, put yourself in the position of Mary and Joseph and this whole, all we wanted to do was get married. Like, we really like each other. Like, we just wanted a wedding, right? And God says, I have other plans. Have you had that happen? When God says, I have other plans? Like, Susie likes to say, you know, I'm sorry, God, this is not what I ordered. This is, not, this is not on the menu for me. God had other plans. By the way, my, my executive assistant, Caitlin, sent me a really bad meme the other day. It said, 
This is the beginning of Silent Night, The Silent Night. Joseph is saying to Mary, but I promise I got a reservation. I got a reservation. And she's, Mary's not saying anything. Silent Night, get it? Never mind. <laughs> you ever had that happen? Caitlin's going to shoot me for telling that's from her. Okay, <laughs> verse 19. Her husband Joseph, since he was a righteous man. Boy, when the Bible calls somebody a righteous man, they're probably a big deal. The word righteous means approved in God's eyes and man's eyes. He was above, this guy was above approach. He was the real deal. And he didn't want to disgrace her. <sighs> Heartbroken. Heartbroken. But I'm not going to throw her under the bus. And he could have. He planned to send her away secretly. There's a righteous man right there. He had every reason, every permission to call her out publicly, shame her and her family, and disgrace her, for the, put a mark on her for the rest of her life. So I'm not doing it. I want her to be able to recover from this because he doesn't know it's the Holy Spirit. He just knows she's pregnant, which is a whole nother thing. Think about Mary choosing not to tell Joseph that little bit of information. She's like, when the angel appears to Mary, somewhere in there she's thinking, you're gonna have to God, you're gonna have to explain this to my husband because he's not gonna believe me. So, so she chooses to let this thing carry out and not go, yeah, but she was willing to let even Joseph misunderstand until God showed up. Whew. Wow. So he's ready to end the deal. Because he's like, I want more for my marriage. And so, I love you, Mary, but no. So let's end this thing quietly and move on. And think about how Mary feels. She's now been accused of being that woman, and she's not. She's not saying anything. And think about Joseph, who's like, all my wife, all my life, God, I've waited for this moment. I've been right before you, and really? Now this is gonna happen, seriously? Think of the emotion and the pain and the upheaval in their lives just because God was working. Sometimes until you get to the end of the story, it looks really hard, doesn't it, sometimes? In the kingdom of God, it can look really um, confusing. Talk about confusion. But, verse 28 begins with but. Here we go. This is good. But when he thought this over, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, that's important, your offspring of David, King David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has con been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Well, that would have been really great information to know. It's okay, Joseph. Joseph. You're not going to violate your righteousness, and Mary not has not broken any laws. This is something God is doing. Now, friends, we're going to talk about this, but imagine being given an assignment that's never been done before in history. I mean, there had been miraculous, um, someone's too old to have a baby, and they have a baby. That happened multiple times in the Old Testament where God provided miraculous, but there was still a husband and a wife interacting as husband and wife. This has never been done before. This is a first-time thing. It's a one-time thing. And, and Joseph gets a dream and goes, you're going to be a player in a one-time thing. This is a one-time thing in history. Oh, by the way, it's the Messiah who's been prophesied for nearly a century, longer than a century, excuse me, not a century, a millennia, forgive me, a thousand years. <laughs> and you're going to be the dad, but you're not the dad. Clear as mud. Makes perfect sense. So she, verse 21, will give birth to a son. You will name him Jesus, Yeshua. He who saves his people from their sins is what the name means. Because he will save his people from their sins. So all this took place so what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled. Isaiah 7, verse 14, behold, a virgin, a young maiden, an unmarried woman and will conceive and give birth to a son that will call him Emmanuel, which translated God with us. Oh, wow, my world just changed. 
So it had been prophesied, but never been done. So Isaiah is brought to Joseph's attention. This is what Isaiah was prophesying. That's Mary. You're going to be the earthly father. Don't mess it up. <laughs> and Joseph wakes up and goes, ah! <laughs> Kate, who do you tell? Imagine that small group meeting. Guys, you're not going to believe the dream I had last night. <laughs> what did you drink before you went to bed? What did you eat before? Jalapenos? What did you, you know, no, you won't believe this dream I had. And then he goes to Mary and says, oh. I mean, imagine the, <laughs> the whole thing is just crazy. And they're just two people. They're not, like Emily said about Ruth last week, they're not super, they're just people like us that God chose to use. So Joseph awoke from his sleep and did, not, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took Mary as his wife, had the wedding, had the people come in, had the big celebration, but did not have any physical relationship with her until after Jesus was born. Now, there's nobility. It's like, this is a whole different game. And what I want and my needs just got trumped by the power of God and what he's up to. I can wait. We're going to wait. All right, let's, let's do some lessons from Joseph, shall we? Got three of them. Number one, without faith, it's impossible to please God. I'm talking to all of us, but I'm talking to men now, men. Faith matters. Faith is a big deal. Faith is not irrational. Faith is not checking your brains at the door. Faith is not an excuse for those who aren't strong enough to handle reality. Faith is a logical extension of reason into the murky world of the kingdom that we cannot see. It's going up a mountain and the mountain disappearing into a cloud, but you know it's there. You know it's there. That's faith. Hebrews eleven six says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. The whole transactional relationship with God is begins and ends with faith. You cannot reason your way to God. You cannot prove God. He's beyond, he's beyond our understanding. You can reason your way toward God. But at some point, you step into that realm of, I believe. Because you can't prove it. He's, he's infinite. You can't prove infinite. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Those who come to God must believe that he exists. That helps. And number two, that he proves that he, um, he, he honors the one. I'm reading a translation here. I haven't recognized. He proves to be the one who re rewards those who seek him. He's a rewarder of those who seek him. So two things when you approach God. Number one, believe in him. Number two, understand he honors those who seek him. That's faith. This whole thing with Joseph and Mary required faith. And remember what Mary said? So be it. I mean, I'm like in the yeah, but, yeah, but. Can you explain that one more time? She said, so be it. May it be to me as you've said. I'm the Lord's servant. Whatever you want to do is good with me. Really? That's faith. That's nobility in the kingdom. So Joseph understands that he, he's going to be dealing with a woman now the rest of his life. He's going to be constantly looking over her shoulder at the rumors. And raising a son who's going to be constantly looking over his shoulder at the rumors. But that's okay. That's the assignment you've been given. They weren't, didn't do anything wrong. But because of the way this child's been brought to the earth, they understand now it's going to be a tough assignment. People are going to criticize and mock and say, why do you stay with her? And she's that girl and he's that guy. And, and by the way, the scriptures don't mention Joseph after age 12, so he probably dies at some point in Jesus' adolescence, and so Jesus is known as the, the son of Mary. But again, the Pharisees said, we weren't born of fornication, meaning you were. That kind of assignment requires faith, friends. And what I want to say to the men in the room is faith does not make you irresponsible. There is a thing called irresponsible faith. It's called presumption. But when you have the word of God saying, this is what 
you are to be and do and the Spirit speaking to you and the confirmation of people around you and 2,000 years of Christian history urging you on to be a mighty man of God, it's not irresponsible. It makes sense. It's what, it's what the world needs now is mighty men and women. And I'm so glad, again, some younger guys are in the room because you're deciding who you're going to be. And I'm in, somebody asked me this week, how many years you've been in ministry? I said, 42. I was two when I started in ministry. That's young for ministry. <laughs> but I was ambushed early. I was by 18 or 19. I'm going, yeah, kingdom. Because I caught it from other men. So mighty, we need men today who understand faith. Faith does not make you weak. Faith does not make you irresponsible or not doing your job. The whole kingdom exhales and inhales in faith. And God gave you a brain. He expects you to use it. But the spirit world is a world of faith. We can't prove it, but it's real. And it takes faith to do the disciplines, to learn to engage in spiritual things. We pray all the time. I love saying this now. It's come true to ICF. We are a house of prayer. We are a house of prayer. We become a house of prayer. Yeah. Folks, that whole thing is faith. I've yet to, to see a manifestation of God walking into a prayer room in the physical. I've seen him in the spiritual many times. But I've yet to see God show up at a prayer meeting physically. But he's there. It takes, it, it's a faith engagement. Men, sharpen that part of your understanding. You've got to grow spiritually. We have so much stimuli physically and so much stimuli emotionally and mentally, which is your soul, but your spirit is where the business is done. You got to strengthen your inner man, your inner man. You got to strengthen that guy and grow him and work on him as hard as you work on your body, work on him as hard as you work on your mind. You're learners and you're, many of you are athletes and you work hard and you, you work on your body. To, that's great to be healthy and strong and you sharpen your mind. Your spirit gets left, many of us, our spirits get left behind and that's where the gold is, is in your spirit. It's a faith engagement from beginning to end. You want to please God, you have to engage in faith. So sign it today. I'm going to be a man of faith. I'm going to develop my faith. I'm going to have men of faith speak into me. That King David, the Ancestor of Jesus said, I'm not going to have people that don't understand God speaking into me. I'm going to have people speaking into me that get God. Why would I have somebody speaking into me that doesn't understand God? He doesn't understand my world. <sighs> Secondly, nothing's impossible with God. And I mean nothing. Luke 18 says, Jesus said to the crowd he was talking to, the things that are impossible with people are possible with God. So this whole scene that plays out is very um, mysterious and a little frightening. Welcome to the realm of the, the miraculous, friends. You can't explain it. But can God cause a young woman who's never been with a man to conceive and give birth to a child? Absolutely. Absolutely. And can God bring the, the husband of that woman into the light so he understands the assignment? Absolutely. It's the, the, there's no such thing as a miracle to God. Miracles are God's, God acting like God in our world. So it looks miraculous to us because it supersedes the laws we understand that govern our world. But God doesn't live in this world. So a young woman conceiving and giving birth to a child by the power of the Holy Spirit, it's a normal thing for God. That's just a God thing. It looks like a miracle to us. An addict suddenly waking up one day and saying, I'm getting sober by the power of God. A prodigal returning home. As we see in baptism, a lost person being saved. That's just God stuff. Deaf ear opening. That's just God stuff. Miracle to us. God's like, there's no thing of miracles. If you understand who I am, there's no miracles. It's just me acting like me in your world. It's heaven invading earth. Nothing's impossible with God, guys. Baylor won the Big 12 in football. I mean, come on. Jesus said, I will come again when Baylor wins the Big 12. It's a sign of the last times. It's a sign of the end times. Forget what's going on in the world. Baylor won the Big 12 and basketball. The world is ending. As we know it, anything is possible with God. 
<laughs> Last one. <sighs> Righteousness matters. He was a righteous man. He didn't cut corners. Can I just be really kind of snarkily honest about something that just kills me? We have a lot of ladies in our church who are single or single again and they want to date, but they're afraid to date Christian men because the Christian men want to know if they'll sleep with them before they start dating. Excuse me, say it again? The Christian men in our church, I don't want to date them because most of them want to know if you have sex with them before you start dating. That's kind of like the requirement. He's, wait, these are Christian men? Do they, have they read the Bible? Guys, righteousness matters. If you want to be the guy God taps on the shoulder and says, I'm going to tell you something, I'm not telling many people, righteousness is part of that. Joseph, Joseph got picked because he, he, really he really believed that how I live matters. So tithing matters. Giving money that God says is his, back to him, that matters. That's righteousness. Your words matter. Your promises, your commitments, your integrity matters. What you do when no one's looking at you matters. There is, there is God waiting to call out men and women. I'm talking to men right now, young men specifically, for huge kingdom assignments. That he needs you to get your ducks in a row because you, he's not gonna give you this assignment if you're struggling to be godly in this assignment. And godliness is a big deal. Holiness is a big deal. Righteousness is a big deal. And it's just, it's just living according to the word of God. And you can do it. It's just not that hard. You can do it. Get a small group, talk to guys, confess your sins, be honest, do your best, read the Bible, pray, ask God to change you and change the things in your heart that aren't right with him. I pray, I pray every pretty much day for me that I'll love God's word, I'll love to pray, and I'll hate sin. And I typically in my notes had the last part in bold. I need to hate sin. Well, that helps. I want to pray. So when I get tempted, I'm like, well, you're supposed to hate this, Will. So maybe you should look elsewhere. Righteousness matters. And what I want to say to ACF is, now that I've given some of you a hard time, I want to affirm a bunch of you because we, I'm looking at a group of guys, many of you, who are just kingdom heroes. I hang out with men who brag on their wives. I'm with men all the time who they can't say enough great things about their spouses. And it just makes me, it's like, that makes me so happy. I'm so blessed to be married to this woman. She's such a godly woman. I've got such a great girl at home. We've been married for so many years and God, boy, God emptied the bank when he gave me this girl. I mean, that's, that's a righteous guy. You know, that's a righteous guy who can't help but brag on his wife because that makes me want to brag on mine. Makes me want to serve mine. And they're all over this church, the men who, who volunteer with young men to teach and instruct them. Men who mentor young men. Men who serve... Um, where if there was a single mom or a single woman that needed a covering that wouldn't be weird, these guys could handle it. They could step in and help a widow or a woman who's in trouble and they wouldn't be weird because they've got integrity just running all over them. We, men who, I'll keep this real vague because these guys do not want me to know, men who love going to restaurants in a groups of 10 or 12 and leaving a hundred dollar bill each one of them for the waiter or waitress. They pick, they pick a target place and just go blow up some waiter or waitress with about a grand on it for a tip. That's, and they don't want to, that's so cool. They just want to bless somebody. Men, men doing that. That, ma that kind of stuff matters. Righteous guys in government, guys in politics, guys in business who don't cut corners who don't say one thing in front of a camera or a constituency and you know there's a smoke-filled room somewhere else that's really making the calls. That there's a deal before a deal, a meeting before a meeting, and that what you hear and see about the business deal or a political deal is really some decision made three months ago in a smoke-filled room. That's not righteous. Yes means yes, no means no. There are guys, there are guys like that doing business in Austin, Texas today. And their platforms are blowing up and they're doing really well because God honors that stuff. If you wonder maybe why God's not reigning on what you're doing, you might check, just check the righteousness quotient and make sure everything's in line. 
the, one of the biggest things men stumble over, I'm on a rant here, I apologize, is the tithing piece. And I don't get this. Why guys struggle with tithing? Because it's a faith thing. But like I'm 10%, poof. You spend more than that on hunting or golf every year, guys. I do. But God gets my first tenth. But it's like, oh, we can't do that. That's a, really? Well, okay, then don't expect God. I'm so off the reservation. Forgive me. Don't say come on. Don't say come on. You do not want me going longer. We've got to baptize in just a second. Um, bring the whole tithe to the storehouse. And t- I, read, I pray Malachi 3 over my life. Malachi 3.10. God says he'll open the windows of heaven and pour out so much favor on you, you can, can't, can't contain it. In response to the tithe, you gotta go first. <laughs> Ever read that text? I want you to open the windows of heaven. Okay, well then tithe. Why are you not opening the windows of heaven? Because you're not tithing. You're not doing what you say. Well, you're not doing what I said you gotta do first. It's a response to the tithe that God opens the windows of heaven. And I've lived it for a lot of years. I don't get why men don't get that. There's a place at the end of Romans or it's the end of 1 Corinthians. It's somewhere in the New Testament. Paul says, act like a man. And he doesn't mean get on your knees and pray. Turn over your hands and worship. Be safe for women. That's what he means. Okay. I'm officially back on the reservation. What I'm asking today is we all agree, guys, to be the kind of men Joseph was. Our yes means yes. Our no means no. We will not compromise on God's word, even if it costs us. That's what I'm looking, that's what I'm calling us to. That's what I want to be, so I'm asking you to be. It's the kind of man God gave the assignment of raising Jesus. It wasn't an assignment. He wasn't a superhero. He was just a guy, but he loved the word of God. He'd do anything to keep it. So I'm asking you to be. I'm going to pray, and we're going to jump into something really cool. Okay? <sighs> Lord, thank you for the time. Thanks for this moment. I pray these men watching online and men in the room will feel the same conviction I do to step up and lead. Be been men like Joseph who just follow the word of God because it's right. And don't compromise. I pray we'll lead well and serve well and give well and be examples of what godliness looks like in a human, in a man. Thank you for examples like Ruth and Mary on the female side. Lord, thank you for examples like Joseph on the male side. Thank you for some of the kings we're going to see next week who were righteous and godly that chose to honor your word. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said...